How are we doing, family? Thanks for joining us again in the book of First Samuel. Today we're in First Samuel chapter 12, and Saul is now king. And with Saul coming in as king, this is Samuel making his uh, formal exit, if you would, handing over the power. So let's dive right in. If you haven't had a chance to read it, why don't you pause and catch up and read. And if you haven't watched a couple of chapters before, why don't you go ahead and do that as well so that today it makes sense for you in the story. But in the meantime, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this chance to look in your word. Thank you for this opportunity to hear about your hand, how you guided your people in the past, and learn how to follow you ourselves in our future. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Samuel anointed Saul as king of Israel. And so now uh, he is giving his final address, his final farewell. You know, it's not his final farewell. It's just more of a farewell address because we will see Samuel again. Uh, but as we go in into 1 Samuel chapter 12, it starts off by Samuel saying to all of Israel, Behold, I've listened to your voice and everything you have said to me and have pointed a king over you. That's Saul. So in verse 2 he says, And now here is the king walking before you. As for me... I'm old and gray, and here are my sons with you. Remember, Samuel thought that his sons would take over after him, but his sons were wicked. They were corrupt. They took bribes. They did evil. And the people were like, look, you're getting old. Uh, we're being oppressed by other people. Your sons are wicked. We can't trust them. We're not going to roll with them. We need a king so we could be like everyone else. And so now Samuel's saying that I am old. And he said that uh, my sons are here. Uh, with you. And he says, I have walked before you from my childhood to this day. And if you remember how the book of Samuel starts out, Samuel literally served in the temple as a small child. And so in verse three, he says, here I am. Testify against me before the Lord and his anointed, that Saul. He's like, basically, I I'm right here. So before God and before your king Saul, if I've done something, anything wrong, let's talk about it right now. He said, whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or who have I exploited? Who have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eye? In other words, who's paid me off to seeing the truth? And he's saying, tell me. He said, let me know now before God and with the king and I will restore it to you. And he's foreshadowing of the things that will happen to them because they now have a king. He's saying, when I was here, I did you no wrong. I didn't take anything from you. Uh, but he's foreshadowing how a king will treat them. So in verse, verse 4, they said, uh, you have not exploited us or oppressed us or taking anything at all from a man's hand. So Samuel said to them, the Lord is a witness against you and his anointed. So the Lord and Saul are a witness against you this day that you have not found anything in my hand. Or in other words, I haven't taken anything from you. And they answered, yes. God and Saul are witness. We have no beef with you. You've done us no wrong. So in verse six, Samuel said to the people, it is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers, your ancestors up from the land of Egypt. Now then take your stand so that I might plead and contend with you before the Lord. Another way that word could be translated is instead of plead or contend so I can rebuke you or so I can tell you off or so I can remind you. Uh, but basically he wants to tell them, look, I want to re remind you how God is taking care of you. So plead and contend with you uh, before the Lord. And he said that uh, <clears throat> when Jacob and his sons had come into Egypt and the Egyptians oppressed them there in Egypt, your fathers cried out to the Lord. Then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. That's why you're there. He's reminding them that the Lord did this. But when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of Hazor's army, and into the hand of the Philistines and the king of Moab, and they fought against them, your parents, for disobeying God. It says, but they cried out in verse 10 to the Lord, saying, we have sinned because we have abandoned or we have rejected the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroths. But now rescue us from the hands of our enemies and we will serve you. That's what the people said to God. In verse 11, then the Lord sent Jerubbabel, that's Gideon, uh, some of us know, 
and Bedad and Japheth. And that Bedad is also Barak. Sometimes the Bible, uh, well, actually the Greek, it's Barak, but in the Hebrew, it's Bedad. Uh, but Dan, I'm sorry. And so, and Japheth and Samuel, and he rescued you from the hand of your enemies on every side and you lived in security. So in verse 12, he says, and when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, remember we read a few chapters back that they were being oppressed. Uh, Nahash, the king of the Ammonites had come against you. You said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us. Although the Lord God was your king. Israel was what is called a theocracy. God was their ruler. We have a democracy, uh, but they had a theocracy. God was their ruler. And said, uh, but, but you that you wanted a king over you, even though God was your ruler. So now, therefore, here is Saul, the king who you have chosen, for whom you asked. Behold, the Lord has set before you a king. Now, verse 14, Samuel says, this covenant or this promise to the people he says, if you will fear the Lord, in other words, if you have awe and profound reverence for God, and if you serve him, and if you listen to his voice and not rebel against his commandment, then both you and your king will follow the Lord your God, and it will be well with you. If you do this, it will be well with you. It will be well with your king. And you notice how he's putting it on the people, not on the king, but on the people. If you serve God, then your king will serve God. And if you follow God, then your king will be blessed. But in verse 15, he says, But if you don't listen to the Lord's voice, but rebel against his commands, that, that word there was literally mouth. If you rebel against his mouth, the words that come out of his mouth, then the hand of the Lord will be against you. Interesting. If you rebel against God's mouth, then God's hand will go against you. And it will punish you as it did your fathers. So in verse 16, so now take your stand. And see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. And so Samuel's getting ready to give them a sign. They let him know he ain't playing. <laughs> and God is serious. And so he says, is it not the beginning of the wheat harvest today? So check this out. In that time of year between Passover and Pentecost was a great harvest. And in that time of year, it normally did not rain. The way their topography is set up, the way their climate and their environment is and their crops are, if it rained when the, when the, when the crops were ready, uh, it would damage the crops. If crops had been picked and it rained, it would damage and they would have a great loss. So generally their custom was to pray that there would be no rain from Passover to Pentecost. And then they would have the celebration of Pentecost after all of that. And so every year they prayed no rain. And so Samuel is saying, is it not the beginning of the wheat harvest today? He said, I will call on the Lord and he will send thunder and rain. Then you will know without no doubts and see that your evil, which you have done is great in the sight of the Lord for asking yourselves for a king. So, so Samuel's still upset. He's still holding a grudge. He's still saying like, <laughs> you shouldn't have done this. And so now he's going to show them how evil it was. And so in verse 18, Samuel called on the Lord in prayer. And the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared both the Lord and Samuel. Because suddenly in a time where it's not used to raining, there was rain and thunder. And so it says in verse 19, Then all the people said to Samuel, Pray to the Lord your God for your servants, for us, so that we will not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for a king for ourselves. So now the people are saying, okay, we get it. It was wrong for us to ask for a king. But yet and still, God still gave it to them. Very interesting. Samuel said to the people, don't be afraid. You have indeed done this evil. Yet do not turn away from following the Lord. He warns them again. But serve the Lord with all your heart. So even in their misdoing, God is saying, serve me with all of your heart. You must not turn away for then you would go after futile things which cannot profit or rescue because they are futile. In other words, their fathers for years have been chasing futile things. They had been chasing idols that couldn't profit them or rescue them. And now all of a sudden they want a king. And Samuel's saying, this is a futile thing that can't rescue you. It's God who's going to rescue you. And this king can't profit you. It's God who's going to profit you. And so that's why he's saying, uh, do not turn away from the Lord because if you do, you will then go after futile things uh, which cannot profit you, which cannot rescue you because 
because they're futile. So in verse 22, it says, the Lord will not abandon his people for his great name's sake, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. And I love what Samuel says in verse 23. He said, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Amazing. Far be it for me to sin against God by not praying for you. In other words, Samuel knew his responsibility. He knew God had set him up as a leader. And he knew that for him to not pray for the people, it would be a sin. It goes on to say, but I will instruct you in the good and the right way. So Samuel knew that as his responsibility as a leader, as a shepherd, as a judge of the people, if he stopped praying for them, then he would be sinning against God. Let me put this back on you. Fathers and mothers, parents, are you praying for your children? Far be it from you to sin against God by ceasing to pray for your children and instructing them in the good and the right way. A lot of times I know parents who pray for their kids, their kids are getting in all kind of trouble, but they aren't instructing their kids. Uh, they aren't disciplining their kids. They aren't guiding their children. And so if you are a parent, it will be a sin for you. If you don't continue to do so, uh, if you are an elder in the church, if you are a leader in your community, if you're a leader at your job or a manager on your job, far be it for you to sin by not praying, praying for the people under you. Are you the head of your household? Um, are you, you know, the man and the husband of the home? I know in 2023, I ain't trying to hit that, but I said it. Are you praying for your household? Uh, I don't know. Do you own uh, apartments and buildings and properties and have people that rent from you? Are you praying for the people who rent from you, whose landlord you are? Uh, do you own a business and are you praying for your employees? I can go down the line. It's very clear here. Samuel says in verse 23, I will not sin by ceasing to pray for and instructing in the good and the right way. And I want to ask, who are you over? Who has God set you over? Who do you have influence who do you have any type of decision-making power over? Are you praying for them? Are you instructing them, especially those directly in your hand, like your family and like your children? Uh, but in verse 24, he says, Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. Consider the great things God has done for you. And then he wraps it up in verse 25 with this warning. He says, But if you still do evil... Both you and your king will be swept away to destruction. And the thing about it is we know how the story goes. They do do evil and them and their kings are swept away to destruction. In fact, 520 years later, Jerusalem, Israel, its kings will be completely taken away by Nebuchadnezzar. And though they will be restored, they've never had a king since. And so right here, Samuel is warning them. Uh, don't do evil or you and your kings will be swept away. And 520 years later, that came to pass. They did not follow this warning. Uh, and eventually they are taken away and they've never had a king since. Uh, they've had some puppet kings or some fake kings, uh, but they've never had a true king since. And so God is warning them to do that. And the same way with us, though we might mess up, though we might be where we are in life because we've made a mistake or we've done evil, God doesn't abandon us. He's saying, okay, you're here now. But now that you're here, serve me, trust me, follow me, and I will bless you. I know you shouldn't have gotten here, but we can't go back and rewind time. Now that you're here, follow me, and I will bless you. That's it uh, for First Samuel chapter 12. We're going to get into chapter 13 with Pastor Robbins. And now it talks about Saul for the first time leading his people to war against the Philistines. Uh, it's going to be a great chapter. So come back, tune in, and join us. God bless family. Let me pray for you before we get out of here. Thank you, Lord, for this day, your blessings, your word. Thank you for the way you blessed Israel despite themselves. And thank you for the way you bless us despite ourselves. Uh, continue to let us take seriously our, our responsibility and not sin against you by praying for those in whose hands and who you've put in our hands, dear God. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless family.